Some of you will have met Paula in the clinic, um, and it's been a real delight because um, Paula's a dietitian who's got a, a, a great interest in this area, and we're hoping that uh, Paula will come and do a lot more work with us in the future. Um, but, but I think this is something that we just don't look at, we haven't looked at as carefully as we should have in the past, and I think it's something that's really important for all our patients. So over to you, Paula. Thank you very much. All hear me there. Um, hi everyone, I'm Paula Hind. So I might have met some of you. Can you hear me all right there? Lovely, thank you very much. Um, bit of a long winded title I've got here today, but as Catherine said, we've been doing an audit which just looked at the incidence of this constipation. And we call it constipation, but actually it's an umbrella term for what, what is also something called intestinal dysmotility. Bit of a long title there, but basically it means a malfunction. It's a slowing down of the transit of contents through the bowel, and that's what the dysmotility is. So it's not normal constipation as you would see it. And you may have come across your GPs that have saying, oh, this is just constipation. Don't worry, here's some lactulose, you know, it's absolutely fine, go away, it'll be fine. And actually, it won't. So this is, this is quite a different constipation, and it is caused by the mitochondrial disease. And I think for me, it's important to make that differentiation because I'm a gastroenterology dietitian, and I've seen straightforward constipation, and that is, is not what it is. So at least you know you can say this is quite different to straightforward constipation. Um, so it's intestinal dysmotility, so it's, it's an abnormal flow of contents through the gut, um, which is why Catherine so kindly said about the laxatives and things and why it's so important. So if it was just a standard constipation and you, know, you didn't bother to sort of take the laxatives or to change your diet, it might not make much of a difference. But from this point of view, it really does. And so hopefully this talk will help demonstrate just, just why that's the case. So it's a chronic constipation. By that, I mean it's persistent, it's long-term, it's not improving with a lot of things that we would do as a standard treatment. So that's the high-fibre diet, the fluids, and sort of regular laxatives, things that you might call sort of lactulose and things like that. So it's, it's not improving with those things. It needs a targeted approach. Um, then you also get the other upper GI symptoms, which is things like reflux, the bloating, regurgitation of food. And it's only since we've done the audit and the questionnaire, we've actually started to pick up on those things. And many people in clinic said to me, oh, I had that symptom, but I didn't really know what it is and I couldn't really quite describe it. And it's, it's only the questionnaire that's actually brought a lot of these symptoms out. So, you know, we, what we found is there's a very high incidence of these other symptoms that happen as a result of the bowel being full of stool. So it's then starting to impact on the upper gut as well. Okay, so the symptoms can reduce the dietary intake. As Catherine said, over the day, the appetite getting that bit poorer, maybe just focusing on fluids later on in the day as well because so full up. Um, and then also liquidized diet. Some people are actually liquidizing their food up or blending it up again later in the day because they find it really difficult to, to get through solid food. Um, what we found is the high fibre can worsen the symptoms, and I'll come on to talk a little bit about that later, but high fibre, you would think traditionally, would be a fantastic thing for this chronic constipation because it'll help the bowel to move. Um, and early on, if it's just a straightforward constipation, that might be okay, but later on, as the symptoms progress, and we're talking about severe symptoms here, the high fibre will make it worse. Again, as Catherine mentioned, if you've got a tube feed, so a nasogastric tube or a gastrostomy tube, the feeds might not be very well tolerated. And it's a bit just like, you know, you fill up a food, dietary intake's really difficult, can't fit more food in. It's the same with a peg feed or a nasogastric tube. You fill up with stool that won't move through and so feeds become difficult to tolerate. Okay, and then how can high fibre make it worse? So, you know, you would think, oh, I've got constipation, so I've got to sort of, you know, take more fruit and vegetables and the wholemeal bread and things, and lo and behold, we're actually worse. We've got more bloating, more wind, more pain. Um, and the reason for that is, so these are the foods, if you don't know them, it's things like wholemeal bread and bran flakes, and this is what we call skin seeds and pips. So that's the indigestible part of fruit and vegetables. So what happens there is it increases the workload of the bowel. So it's actually, it's, it's doing that to help get the bowel functioning and working. This 
forms a gel, so it swells up in the gut, it forms a gel, and it gathers water as it goes along. So if you imagine a Weetabix in milk, it just swells and gathers all of that, that milk up, and then suddenly it's a solid. It's the same with these types of foods, so they swell up in the gut. So if the gut's already full of stool and you put fibre in, it actually swells up and causes worse distension and, and pain and things. So it, it, that's, that's the effect it has. So this increased workload puts a strain on an already irritated bowel, causing further problems. So the treatment for this is called a low residue diet or a low fiber, and residue is just the part left over. So if you think of what I said, the skin seeds and pips, that's the bit left over. And if you've ever looked at infant poo, not that it's a particularly nice subject, but you can see some peas and sweet corn husks and things in there. It's exactly the same thing. We don't need those things. We can't use them. Our body just gets rid of them. Um, so that, that residue part is what causes us the trouble. So it's the, the increased workload of the bowel and, and the fact that that residue is there is causing distress to the gut. So this low residue diet may be temporary. So I don't know if any of you have ever had, you know, you've had the old x-ray that's full of sort of stool and things. We're going to have a clean out. So we would give high dose laxatives to try to clean that out and then sort of start again. Sometimes we just use this low residue diet during that period because afterwards things can be okay. But quite often it's, it's generally needed long term. So it may be a temporary measure, but generally needed long term. And again, you would want to know from a specialist how long to remain on that sort of diet. It doesn't have a lot of vitamins and minerals because we're taking all the fruit and vegetables out, which are full of, as we know, full of nutrients, and also all of the wholemeal things out. So that's all the B vitamins and things. So that diet is quite a restrictive diet. And if you're on it for more than four weeks, we would suggest a vitamin and mineral tablet. Okay, and then this is the eat well plate. So this is how we're told to eat. So if you've got terrible constipation, you can see that you know, many of these foods are gonna cause real trouble. Now, if you're seen by a dietitian that doesn't have this specialist knowledge, and maybe perhaps for diabetes, if you're diabetic, they will go to the eat well plate and say, yeah, you've got to have all this fiber and things. It's really important to communicate that actually that's maybe not something you can tolerate because you have this problem with constipation. Um, so this is just the general advice and it does need adapting for low residue. So we would change that quite significantly. The things that cause major problems are obviously the fiber. So that's the fruit and vegetables, the wholemeal things. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about how we can switch those around for you. And fat as well can cause some trouble because it just goes very slowly through the gut. But protein, on the other hand, doesn't really cause any problems to dysmotility. So all your protein foods are fine. And that's all the sort of low-fat dairy products and meat and fish and things. They're absolutely fine. But carbohydrates in the form of those high-fiber foods and some fats can cause trouble too. So what to avoid? I know there's a lot on here. Don't worry about reading it all. <laughs> so first of all, just the fruit and vegetables. So we would say skin, seeds and pips. So if you think of, you know, your apples and pears and various things are going to have a skin on. Um, we can remove that skin, actually, and we can stew fruit, which makes it slightly easier to tolerate. Um, but, you know, certainly avoiding fresh fruit and vegetables, really, because they cause most trouble. And then the cereals, it's anything brown. So it's wholemeal bread, it's granary bread, seeded bread, and the cereals of the same variety, really. So bran flakes and all bran, this sort of thing. Um, and again, some biscuits are very high in, in these, fiber, these fibers as well. So things like um, oat cakes and tea cakes and the like. Um, and then in terms of meat, it's just things that have got peas and onions in it. So I don't know if anybody's ever had severe constipation, but certainly onions can cause a lot of trouble. Peas as well and mushrooms. And then again, fish, it's bones and things that might not pass so easily through the intestine that cause trouble. And then egg dishes with vegetables in. Again, cheese, if it has cottage cheese with pineapple there, or chives or onions. And then generally all fats are okay, but I am gonna talk about that a bit more in detail later. And the milk, it's really just yogurt type products where they've got fruit pieces or sort of barley and greens in there. So that's the foods to avoid. 
And there is a lot you can actually have instead, <laughs> thankfully. So things like cornflakes and frosted cornflakes and the, the sort of rice-based cereals. So what we call the white cereals, and they are fortified with vitamins and minerals, but they don't have as many vitamins and minerals as the whole grain type cereals. So, and then again, the grains, so it's white rice, not brown rice, white pasta, not brown pasta. Also the pulses, um, things like semolina and tapioca. So rice pudding type thing is, is absolutely fine. Potatoes without the skin, vegetables. We're just seeing quite small portions of a well-cooked vegetable, but generally the roots are fine. So that's carrots and squash and things like sweet potato are absolutely fine. And again, if they're quite well cooked and mushed down, they're gonna be okay. And the fruit, just small portions, but again, you can stew that or you can remove the skin, which is absolutely fine. And then nuts, we, we, we do sort of have those allowed in, in some forms, but generally they cause a lot of trouble. So what we would say there is just to have them ground down. So ground almond in a pudding, for example, wouldn't be a problem, but whole nuts will cause a lot of trouble. And then cakes, it's just any product that's got a lot of raisins in it. So if it's like a fruit cake and it's loaded with raisins, it's really high in fiber. So that's just some ideas of some other cakes you can have there. There's the sort of plainer type, so Madeira and sponge. And, and obviously, if you're diabetic, this advice will be slightly different. Um, the milk puddings will be OK. And the cake, if it's tagged on to the end of a meal and you need some extra insulin, is absolutely fine. So the diabetic advice might need to be altered a little bit because the diet's quite limited. So there's slightly different advice for diabetes where you're on a low residue diet. And if anyone wanted to ask me about that, I'd be more than happy to explain. Okay, and then healthy eating. For someone who has severe constipation and is overweight, again, you might want to be going for the fibre to try to get your weight down. And that's difficult if you've also got severe constipation. So it's things like trying to go for the low-fat dairy products where possible, and that'll limit the calories going in. So it'll help treat the constipation, but also help treat weight. Um, and then just grilling the meat and avoid adding extra butter and you know avoid sort of fried and fatty foods and sweeteners instead of sugar. So there is a way to get around this to still be able to have weight loss and treat the constipation. And then suitable snacks, we've got sugar-free jellies and diet yogurts and sort of plain biscuits and things. <laughs> Um, so it's not too bad a diet. Yes, I'm running out of time. I'm sorry, I'll just flick on quickly. I could talk about this all day, you can tell. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Someone has to stop me. <laughs> so there we are. And just plenty of fluids. And there are some tips there as well. So, I mean, you can get a copy of this presentation. I'm sure there's no problem there. Um, and again, just fat. If you've done everything else and you've reduced all the fiber, then fat might be a problem. We might need to bring that down a little bit. And we generally just say spread the fats out throughout the day, but the oils are better tolerated than solid fats. Okay, and so in summary, the important thing is to know the goal. So what are we aiming for? We're aiming for softer stools that are more normal, that we pass more often, so the more frequent. Also, regular Movicol is very essential for the diet to work. And the Movicol, where it's two sachets twice a day, isn't it? It's very, very important to take that because it is a severe constipation. So without that, this diet wouldn't work. So just monitoring the stools, monitoring weight, and if things aren't going well, just to get back to the team about that. Um, and then if the, if the diet isn't working, also to remember there's probably a reason. So it may be that you need to prep to sort of clear that stool and then to start again. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. So, so I, I think what's really important here is that um, we are taking the symptoms very seriously, but also how this has to be tailored to individual people. So what I really, what's very important is that everybody doesn't suddenly move to this diet. It's very much something that you should discuss a bit like the exercise you should discuss when you come up to Kinnick. But I, we just thought it was really important that people got an idea about what is in these other diets and how we think this can help. So I think it's, it's, it's just, you know, all of us that are in Kinnick, or ring up Catherine or whatever, and hopefully, as I say, Paula will be around a lot more to give her a specific advice. The whole idea, as with everybody's care, 
is that we tailor the care to the individual and it will very much depend upon what the individual symptoms are. Okay, any specific questions for Paula? Is there a flyer with, with all the Right, right. So what we'll do is what I think it's a very good question and we should, you know, I think we're going to put this information up on the website. So those of you that have got computers will be able to get this access, this information. Those of you that don't have computers, ring up Catherine and she'll send us. <laughs> and those of you that don't have telephones, better start me living in the 21st century. <laughs> okay? Right. We better move on because we've now got the patients. But can I just thank our speakers? <laughs>